Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan Does like knowing animals Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan Does like knowing animals Hey you guys, welcome to Knowing Animals the podcast. Knowing Animals is a podcast where we talk to animal study scholars about a piece of their work. I'm Siobhan O'Sullivan and I do like knowing animals. Now, as always, this episode of Knowing Animals is brought to you by our friends at ASA. ASA is the Australasian Animal Studies Association and it's the membership group for academics, artists and animal advocates interested in animal issues. ASA is the best way to find out what's happening about animals and animal studies in Australia and around the world. ASA has a conference every two years and that conference is coming up very soon in Adelaide. So if you're not following ASA on Facebook, if you're not a member of ASA, then you're making a very serious error in judgment and you should go immediately to their Facebook page. I'm going to be at the ASA conference in Adelaide and I'm going to be recording episodes of Knowing Animals. So I hope to see you there. ASA, the Australasian Animal Studies Association. Okay, well, we've got another special episode of Knowing Animals uh, this fortnight. Now, I'm actually suddenly very nervous about your surname. I should have practiced before we started recording. This episode of Knowing Animals is not focused on a um, journal article or book as it often is, rather is focused on a documentary. And I'm joined by my colleague from UNSW, Mary Zunazi. That's pretty good. Oh, okay. Mm. Thank you. Now, Mary is a sociologist. As I say, she's a colleague of mine at UNSW. And today we're going to be discussing her recently released documentary, Dogs of Democracy. And when uh, I hand over to Mary, she's going to tell us all about how you can also watch Dogs of Democracy. I believe you can buy the CD, uh, the DVD and you can also stream it online. But for the moment, please welcome to the podcast, Mary. Thank you very much, Siobhan. Um, actually, I'll just, I'll just correct. You can get the DVD, but you can't stream it online yet. Oh, yeah, okay. So that, that's okay. Okay. Um, but remembering this is uh, kind of March next year? Yes, yes. It still may not be available. Oh, okay. But the DVD very well may be. Uh, is, is. So. Is available. Yes. Okay. So where will people go to if they want to get a copy? Yes. Um, Ronan Films website. Yeah. Um, it's Dogs of Democracy, Ronan Films, and uh, you'll be able to purchase one there. And you'll also be able to see the trailer if you go dogs of democracy trailer it will come up wonderful yeah. Yeah. wonderful so mary dogs of democracy what inspired the doco yeah it's a very interesting um history to this story i was actually in athens for the first time in my life i'm a greek australian but i went there and i was i'd arrived actually in the middle of a crisis so it was a very sort of tense time in the city um but what I noticed, at the, so I actually thought I could imagine how civil wars happened because it was so tense. But at the same time, I noticed um, this dog on the, uh, on actually on marble steps out front of this most expensive hotel in Athens. And I actually thought the dog was dead. And I thought, I started to believe every single stereotype about Greek people. Oh, they're lazy, they don't look after their animals, all this sort of thing. Then I realised actually that this dog was alive, very much alive and very well fed. And all around the square, there were many, many stray dogs um, living around Sintagma Square. So that sparked an interest in me about how are these dogs living in a way as part of kind of citizens of the city and who is sort of taking care of these animals and what this might say about, I guess, the human capacity for care. But also the dogs in themselves were... Um, the dignity of them was actually quite interesting. So that was the start or the initial starting point for the film. Yeah, yeah wonderful. So you started noticing the dogs as soon as you got there and then what was your journey of exploration to try and understand the relationship between the dogs and the community? Yeah, that was also very interesting. So I I had actually never made a film before, although I'd been very much interested in filmmaking. I've made a lot of radio documentaries. So what I decided to do was um, actually get a camera, um, go back again and uh, film the dogs. So I actually uh, spent days and weeks and months um, following the dogs around the city, like literally following the dogs. And 
that way I was hoping to kind of come across and meet people who then were looking after them. So it was sort of, it was really quite organic. It was actually following them and I also shot the film mostly from a dog's point of view. So I really tried to get down to their level and to kind of really follow them. And then they, they, they sort of started to get used to me. I mean, they, I think you see actually in the film sometimes they're looking over their shoulder like, who is this person? But after a while they got used to my habits just as much as I got used to theirs. So there was quite an interesting relationship that I developed with the dogs in the first instance and then the dogs and the people. Yeah. So... You introduce us to some of the caregivers, many of whom are doing it voluntarily, and you also get to know the dogs by name. Would you describe it as, was there an affection that developed between you and the dogs? I think, um, yeah, look, there was an affection just because I love the animals, you know. I mean, I was, I don't think actually I could ever have a pet dog again just because I, I mean, I love dogs and I mean, you know, I wish I did have one as a pet. But I think just being with these dogs that have to live this life that is in a way, it, it's it's so hard, it's so rough. I mean, they're not, um, they're out on the streets, they're reliant on people and their care. And so I guess the affection that arose was really around the witnessing of this kind of amazing relationship between the dogs and the people, but also the fact that the dogs just have their own place in the city. I mean, Athenians are so used to these dogs, so they don't even often, perhaps they don't even often notice them, but they're there, they cross the streets with them, they know when to cross the streets, they have a real sense of who is, um, you know, who's caring and who's not. But often you find tourists, this was really an interesting thing, um, there's one scene actually in my film of this um quite incredible dog who just lies on her back in the middle of this kind of you know city and she looks like she's kind of got she's dead but she's not she's just spread out and then all of a sudden there's this crowd that kind of builds up around her because they're they're amazed you know and this is mostly Athenians but I did hear a tourist walk past and there was these young teenage boys who were starting to rub her belly with their with their feet and I I heard the tourists say oh I hope they're not going to harm her and I thought that was just such a interesting way of viewing the city and viewing the people and given that they had no history of it that in fact the dogs in this context were very well looked after and very well respected I have to also say that there is a difference between city dogs and country dogs Mm -hmm. not all there is um, over three million strays in Greece and one of the reasons for that is um Greeks don't euthanize their dogs so or euthanize their animals so they that's why there's so many but the ones in the city uh the ones that I saw uh, you know there's volunteers and of course there's volunteers in the country areas as well but a- Athens I think is quite unique um in its way of taking care of animals and I think that's what I observed in the film mm. so in a country such as Australia we we have kind of two things going on with our animals. In one sense, many animals are extremely privileged, so they get a lot of veterinary care and uh, very nutritious food and that kind of thing. And at the same time, they're often quite oppressed, so they have to be in a backyard or in a house, they can only go for walks at set times, they have to be on a lead, etc. Did you form a view about whether it's better to be free and have a bit of a rough life and not get the veterinary care or to get all the privilege but have to live under a human-dominated regime? Yeah, that's an interesting question, actually. Um, Look, when I was speaking, I'm I'm going to firstly talk about people's in Greece and their responses. I mean, a lot of the people that look after the animals would say things like, well, you know, they have it rough, but at least they're free. You know, they can can roam the city and they can do their own sort of thing. Um, So I think there's that level of it. And... I guess with the dogs around Syntagma Square, the ones that I, I kind of filmed, they are looked after by this, these volunteers who do give them kind of care, veterinary care, and they do have their tablets and so on and so forth. So they are um, looked after in a way as well. And I guess it's a hard one, you know. I mean, it's – I think as I was saying before, I think I just – I can't imagine am I still having a pet anymore because, <laughs> because of the freedom – of, I mean, in that sense of the dogs being able to move at their own pace. But look, it is a lonely life too, I think. And so not all dogs um, have it good. Um, some dogs live together, you know, twos or threes. Some travel by themselves. 
some live with um, or hang around people. One of the interesting things I did notice when I was filming was most of the dogs in Athens do tend to like to be around people. Mm. So whether they're actually uh, sitting near them or in the square, like they like that sense of community, I think, um, and relationship to humans. So as well as relationship to their other species, to their own kind. But because they have been so domesticated, they do like that human feel, I think. And that was something that I had the privilege of witnessing. I was very, very lucky to um, be able really to make this film, actually. Mm -hmm. So the dogs are the subject matter in and of themselves, but they're also a metaphor or uh, somehow used to, to say something about the political situation in Greece. How did you make that connection? Yes, so um, it is indeed right. The, the film Dogs of Democracy, I guess, is a little bit of a clue, the democracy part. Um, the connection is that there is actually a famous dog called Lukanikos, which means sausage in Greek, who... I found out when I was in Athens, once I was sort of making these inquiries into the film, I'd been told about Lukanikos and he uh, went to almost every political protest um, and was almost the mascot for the protesters during the, um, particularly during the Syntagma protests in 2011, which was a sort of uprising against the government. But it was one of the many uprisings that happened around the world against kind of the ways in which governments were treating their people, but in particular in Greece because of the economy and because of the debt. So Lukanikos became a little bit of a hero. So I also, within the film, I trace Lukanikos' story and that's how I was able to make the connection between the austerity measures that are happening today in Greece um, and the dogs. But also that I really wanted to make a story about how the relationship that we can have with animals allows a certain care, particularly in this example, and what that might mean for humans if we could care like this, like how, how it would change perhaps how we would view people and how we would no longer kind of view people as kind of economic subjects but actually as people with full dignity and you know who are suffering Mm. and Greece really is a situation where you know it's ongoing people just because it's not in the news anymore doesn't mean it's not ongoing Mm. similarly with animals just because you think things have changed Mm. doesn't mean that they have Mm. Um, things Mm. still go on so Mm. yeah it's interesting in the documentary you observe that quite a few people, including elderly people, are now homeless. Mm. And, of course, the dogs, in a sense, are also homeless. So I guess, you know, I guess if you've got to be homeless, it's perhaps better to be a dog than a human. Is that what you say? Or it's difficult for everyone? Or Yeah, look, um, look, it's, yeah, it's difficult. Uh, I mean, it, you know, the human, I mean... Do, the dogs in this in this particular context have lived in the city, so they have a, a kind of familiarity with it in a different way to humans. And I think for the humans having lost their jobs and the crisis, um, it's devastating. You know, it's a kind of devastating situation. So they're different. I mean, they're, you, in a way, you can't compare it the situation in that sense. Although the thread of homelessness is there. I mean, the but what I found, uh, I think most. Um, upsetting was the fact that there were uh, people who were around my parents' age in their sort of 80s, particularly old men, who were just, you know, kind of shuffling around the streets now with no, you know, having lost their dignity. Mm. And even younger men too, like men in suits on street corners sort of sitting down begging really because they had lost their lost their jobs. So these, yeah, these situations are are devastating and in fact animals what was interesting I was talking to a woman who had who's not in the film but who had um, lost her job she was a young woman she was about 28 29 and there's one particular dog in the film who is one of the stars in a way but he would come and comfort her he would sit with her while she would be selling uh, what's similar to the big issue in Australia which is a homeless magazine and he would just come and sit on her feet on cold days and they became they developed a relationship so i think the dogs actually became a way also or are a way of people connecting too when they're feeling distraught the animals are kind of there mm. so they provide i don't know a sense of um, safety maybe or or love in a way that nothing else is providing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 
in an interesting way. Yeah. Lovely. So, Mary, you bring the dogs into uh, focus very much in the film and I'm sure there are a lot of listeners who would love nothing more than to make a film about animals or about an issue they're passionate about. Do you have any advice for budding uh, filmmakers? <laughs> yeah, well, this film was, you know, this really was a passion project in a way. Um, I really, all I really wanted to do was tell a story with the camera, um, which is kind of what I did. And I guess, you know, I just say pursue it. But, uh, you know, filmmaking is an expensive enterprise because you know it requires a whole range of other things once you kind of get your your footage but I think um, you know today I guess with uh, editing techniques and programs you can kind of edit things Um, so I think you know if you're interested in things you should you should just do it I mean in a way this film was made you know it, it wasn't made cheaply and it was made because I was so determined to make it and I'm I'm glad I did, but yeah, I just say I just say kind of do it. Don't don't let things stop you. I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. But that's yeah. Good advice and good yeah. advice for life, perhaps. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so Mary, I ask everyone who comes on Knowing Animals to answer five quick questions. Now, in your case, we might adapt the questions a little bit because even though you've made this uh, beautiful documentary that's very much focused on the lives of animals. You don't perhaps consider yourself a classic animal study scholar like a lot of people who come on the show. So I might adapt it a little bit and um, ask you perhaps a little bit about animals and film or animals and and scholarship more generally. Mm -hmm. So can you recall the first piece of pro-animal either scholarship or film that had a big impact on you? Oh, gee, that's that's, that's, – I I haven't even thought about that. I was just thinking, okay, oh. Well, actually, you know, I read a um, story, a book – by Paul Auster uh, called Timbuktu, mm-hmm. which was written from the point of view of a dog. Oh, really? Um, and I think that it, that's a very interesting book. It's it's about a dog's kind of abandonment and yeah. his view of the city. So I guess maybe yeah, Paul yeah. Auster's Timbuktu. Yeah. I remember very clearly reading Black Beauty as a girl. It's ah. amazing how a book that you read in your childhood can have such a big impact and can – be recalled throughout the rest of your life. But yeah. it's funny, you know, look, I mean, for me, I grew up with animals. Like we just, I don't know, as Greeks, I don't know, we just had animals everywhere. We had chickens and cats and dogs and they all somehow had to communicate with each other. So, uh, I mean, I've they've always been part of my life. So even without having any influence of texts or or whatever, they were just – their presence is what influenced yeah, yeah. me. I think I've always – they've always been part of how I view the world. Yeah. yeah. And it's lovely. The Greek-Australian community have brought – got mini agriculture into the cities. They were a very important part of having chooks in backyards yeah. in Sydney and things like that, which we, we also had chooks actually. So can you recall the first piece of pro-animal either scholarship or, or documentary making, either film or radio that you produced? Is it this piece? Um, I'm just thinking, did I produce anything else? Um, I've made quite a lot of docu- radio documentaries. Um, I've always dreamt of doing um, a short series on animals, which I will do at some point, of short stories. But I'm just trying to trace back. I think I think this is probably the, the main, yeah, the main. The most focused. The most focused, yeah. Yeah, Because yeah. yeah. I note that uh, Kuitsi has endorsed the film. He has, yeah. yes. Because the next question is, can you name an animal studies scholar who's had a big impact on you? Yeah, okay. Him? Yeah, so J.M., I, I pronounce it curtsy, but curtsy? maybe it's... Sure. I don't know. Oh, so I for, don't those know. Of you, for those of you out there, he's the wonderful um, author of Disgrace and um, the Nobel Prize winning author. And Look, yeah, I mean, uh, I read his um, The Lives of Animals um, many years ago and... Actually, the, f- the funny thing about that, at the time I had a dog called Zara and um, my neighbour actually stole my book um, and then I, I didn't realise this and had taken it to a book launch of his and got it signed by him. Oh, <laughs> so I have this sweet. book that says, you know, to Mary and Zara from, from him. Um, so he, yeah, look, his, um, his passion, his... Uh, writings, his force, I guess, has been. And I was just so honoured that he um, 
endorsed the film. And, I mean, he really loved it as well and he felt that, you know, he wished that people could see it. And, and I mean, that's the thing. I hope people can see it yes. because it – I mean, it's not it's not really a film. It's a film about the dogs and, and, it, and it, that's what it is. And I think if people can see the film, they'll sort of understand a lot of stuff about the animals but also about Greece yeah, as well. Yeah, absolutely. So what's the most important thing academics can do for animals, do you think? I think academics can write about animals. They can also educate in classrooms. I think... I think as humans, we can just be more empathetic. And I think the way, and even beyond that, in a way, um, introduce people to the necessity that it's not, you know, it's not just humans that needs need rights, but also even, it's not even that, it's like the way we treat anything in the world requires a certain respect. And I think that's probably the fundamental thing. And that's an ethical question for me, like how mm. you ethically respect anything Mm. And animals are a crucial part of that, just mm. as, it, as the environment is as well. Mm -hmm. Well, that leads me to the final question, which is, if you had the power to change one thing about the relationship between humans and animals, what would it be? Yeah, it would be how we view that relationship. In other words, that we are not superior to, um, that we have a lot to learn from animals. And I think that's what was the beauty of making this film, really, is that I mean, I learnt so much from the animals mm. um, and, you know, I'm hoping to a certain extent that's conveyed a little bit. Um, but, you know, what they teach us, I think um, we can always be in gratitude towards. Mm. Wonderful. So, Mary, what are you working on next? Uh, my, my next film is actually um, going to be more focused on the refugee crisis. So I'm, I'm sort of moving away from animals, but... but this film started um, the sort of investigation into that. So that's the next documentary. But I do have some short stories up my sleeve about animals. So. Oh, wonderful. And so how can people find out more about your work? Right. Yes. Um, uh, I think, well, just in terms of this film, as we were saying earlier, I think it's um, just Dogs of Democracy, uh, Ronan Films. Um, I think if you just type in my Mary Zanazi, you know, things will come up on my books and, you know, the website at UNSW and mm -hmm. so on and so yeah. forth. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure that I found the trailer on YouTube for Dogs of Democracy. Yes, it's on YouTube and it's also on um, IMDB film uh, base. So it's yeah. also on the film base yeah. as well. So uh, and it's also on Vimeo via um, Ronan Film. So, there's yeah, there's different ways of getting yeah, it. Yeah, you can find it. So, go to your computer, Google up Dogs of Democracy, check out the trailer and then also buy yourself a copy and uh, show it around. So, thank you so much for joining us, Mary, and thank you to the listeners for joining us for Knowing Animals, the podcast where we talk to animal study scholars about their work. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at knowing underscore animals or on Facebook at knowing animals. Also, don't forget to review us on iTunes. Reviews make it easier for other people to find us. I'm Siobhan O'Sullivan and I do like knowing animals.